Welcome everyone. This is uh, Marty McCann. I'm the, the chairman of the Committee on Geotechnical and Geologic Engineering. Uh, we are a, a standing committee of the uh, National Academy of Engineering and Sciences, and we are under the board of Earth Science Resources. And this is one of our regular webinars on geotechnical and geologic engineering topics. So I want to welcome you all today and thank you for, for, for participating. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to uh, first thank our uh, director, Sam Magsino. Uh, her, her email address is on a number of the slides that uh, you've seen um, rotating here. Uh, Sam is our director and uh, she can be our, your main point of contact for, for the committee uh, about future webinars, getting on mailing lists and, and things of that sort. And also wanted to thank um, uh, Remy Chepetta, who is our program assistant, who, who makes all the technology work for us. So Sam and Remy, thank you both for uh, your assistance in putting this webinar together. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Scott Anderson, who is a member of the CAGA committee and will be moderating the, the session today, uh, introducing our speaker and um, facilitating the Q&A session uh, after our talk here. So Scott, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Marty. And, and thanks everyone for joining uh, this afternoon. Um, the, the, the screen that's showing right now talks about our in-person meeting coming up at the end of the month. But of course, you're here today to uh, um, listen to a webinar uh, titled Regional Scale Landslide Risk Assessment uh, Methodology and Application. And that's going to be delivered by uh, Dr. Joe Wortman. And, and just as a little background uh, for Dr. Wortman, he directs the Natural Hazards Reconnaissance Facility, which is known as the RAPID at the University of Washington where he's the H.R. Berg Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He's a former editor of the ASCE Journal on Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering. He's the author of over 100 professional articles on geologic hazards. And of special note, I think, is that Joe's very active, more, more, more so than many of us anyhow, in, in publishing essays and op-eds, and they've appeared in places like the New York Times and the Seattle Times and other mainstream media venues. He's a recipient of research honors, uh, many of them, and including most recently the Geologic Society of America's Burwell Award in Engineering Geology, which I was fortunate enough to be working alongside Joe. So uh, with that, I want to introduce Joe and uh, turn it over to him. Okay, thank you, Scott. And, and thank you, Sam, uh, Scott, and Marty for coordinating and facilitating the webinar this afternoon and to all of you who are joining remotely. It's my intuition to say thank you for being here, but since I'm doing this from a small audiovisual room in Washington, D.C., um, that seems like maybe it's not appropriate. So I'll say thank you for being there wherever you are uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be talking about some work that we've done over the last several years on regional scale landslide risk assessment, and I'm going to uh, briefly review the methodology, and then I'm going to step through the application in a very systematic way to offer an example, and that example is going to be for the country of Lebanon, and um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about why that's the focus of uh, the study I'm going to be presenting today. Um, I, I think all of us are aware of the rapid advances and, and, and really what GIS or Geographic Information Systems has enabled for the geographic sciences community in general, but I think it's worth pausing to just think a bit where, where we are today and, um, and what this has enabled and, and where this really leaves us and what opportunities it prevents, uh, presents to us in the geologic hazards community. So I, I see us today in, in the age of ubiquitous digital mapping data, and, um, and you only have to reach into your pocket and access your smartphone to probably find one of several applications that are using mapping data. Uh, Google Maps, Apple Maps, Yelp, amongst many other mapping applications. And increasingly that data is, is becoming not only open, but at least freely available. And 
this whole notion of scale that we've uh, that we've had for for a number of years, I think, is also changing. Scale is is whatever the resolution you decide to zoom in or pinch into your screen, and um, and I've illustrated that in my my little diagram here, where we're visualizing lidar data at, at two different scales. And that resolution, the ability to zoom in, has been enabled not just by the remote sensing technologies that have, uh, that have come around in the last 10 years, but also some pretty significant advancements on the platforms that have hosted those remote sensing technologies. And I'm just going to offer one example. I have a photo of Jake Daphne, who is the operations specialist for the Rapid facility, and he's piloting a high resolution uh, LIDAR system on a, on a drone, and this allowed us to uh, develop bare earth LIDAR of an active landslide site in Oregon in just a couple days. And something like that, of course, would have been really unthinkable just a decade ago. So I think we're seeing some really important advancements there. But that's not really the motivation for this work. Those are the tools. Um, I think a lot of the motivation here stems from experiences with the 2014 OSO landslide, um, which occurred in Washington state and, and very tragically killed 43 people. And if you look at the LIDAR image that I'm projecting here, you can see that the, um, the side slopes of the Oso Valley are, are flanked with, uh, with, with large landslides, many of those long run out landslides. And just a cursory um, depiction of the kind of risk that was present at the time of the Oso landslide is, is shown in the diagram on the right. And, and it's it, perhaps unsurprisingly, we see that, um, that this is above what has largely been seen as acceptable using some international standards for, for loss of life. And so Oso was a pretty risky place to be. And the issue is that a lot of that information doesn't make it into the way we traditionally map landslide hazards. And so just below, I've shown the uh, landslide hazard map, geologic hazard map actually, that was available for the region at the time of the Oso landslide. And what you can see is that the, the dark box depicts the location of the Steelhead Haven community that was inundated by that landslide. And you can see that falls outside of the landslide hazard zone, which is depicted with the red cross hatching. And, um, and while there were zo zoning ordinances that required setbacks from those landslide hazard zones, this really doesn't convey the, the risk to those who lived in Oso at the time of that tragedy. And that's a problem that's not just limited to, um, to Washington State. If we look at another um, well-known landslide, site in the United States, the community of La Conchita in California. If you make reference to the available landslide hazard maps for that community, on the lower left, I've shown the um, uh, California Department of Geology co-seismic landslide hazard zones. And you can see that the community falls outside of that zone. Um, the zone is depicted in blue. And so we're not capturing the kind of run out or inundation behavior that often occurs in these kinds of events. And to the right, is a mapping that was put together after the Thomas fire of debris flow hazard maps. And this comes with the stipulations that does not predict downstream uh, impacts and potential debris flow runout paths. And so again, that's very much the standard. And one of the things we were aiming at in this project was to provide a better depiction of the kind of risk to, um, to people, but also to uh, potential loss um, of, of capital assets and infrastructure and so forth. So what I'm going to be talking about today is part of a larger effort that um, began in, in 2016. We've published a paper in engineering geology on the multimodal method of landslide hazard assessment. I want to just briefly introduce the, the research team. And I have a picture in the upper right as a, a stop during some of our field work in Lebanon. Um, that's Alex Grant in the, in the leftmost uh, position in the photo. Alex is a former PhD student who's now at USGS, and behind Alex is Grace Sabujab. Um, so sitting across from Grace is Will Pollack. You'll hear a lot about his work this afternoon, and um, Will is sitting next to Maria Twack. And I want to acknowledge two people who are also been involved in the work who are pictured here. Angela Said is a um, uh, researcher uh, was formerly at the Lebanese American University and Chris Massey is with GNS Science in New Zealand and he's been a close collaborator over the last five or six years. So what I'm going to focus on today is a um, is, is encircled in red it's a our development of a platform for landslide risk assessment and I'm going to make reference to version one here and at the conclusion of the presentation I'll talk about version two and what's to come. But this built upon the multimodal method in a couple significant ways. We've made modifications to the geotechnical models. We didn't, we've included a precipitation-induced landslide module. We have um, 
a module for uh, modeling runout. And ultimately, the product of this is not hazard, but it's risk assessment. And I want to say that one central theme that has run through our work is the idea of low cost, high resolution mapping. And before leaving this slide, I want to also say that this work has been supported by the National Science Foundation and, um, and, and none of this would happen without that generous financial support. And we also received supplemental support from the United States Agency for International Development. So uh, this work has a lot of relevance to policy. There are currently two bills that are pending in Congress, one's in the Senate and one's in the House. I'm just gonna briefly review the one in the House and this has been led by Susan Del Bene. Um, it's come out as a couple different iterations, but I want to note that it includes provisions to develop, maintain, a, uh, develop and maintain a publicly accessible national landslide hazard and risk inventory. And it also includes a provision for establishing the 3 dep or the 3D elevation program. And the status of this bill is that it's currently out of committee, and that's significant. Only about one in four bills make it out of committee. And the current prognosis, at least according to Scopus Labs, which is a legislation analytics firm is that this has a 50% chance of being enacted. And so if this moves forward, it will really be quite significant for us as a landslide community. And that bill has a, a, a lot of really important stuff that captures the benefits of regional scale hazard mapping and risk assessments. And there have been reports that have demonstrated that mapping is a very cost effective investment. It obviously supports land use planning. It serves as a transparent basis for making important decisions. Um, it allows mitigation actions to be prioritized. And I think really one of the exemplars is the USGS seismic hazard mapping program. And, and what I've shown in the lower right is the way that information from, from that mapping has now been converted to risk. Ross Sign has, has developed um, an application called Trembler, which allows you on a, on a, a house specific basis to look at your seismic risk throughout uh, the, uh, the United States. I think that mapping also plays an important role in enabling citizens to make informed decisions. It enables, by making information openly available, it enables land and housing markets to operate efficiently. And then really, I think unless people understand the risks they face, it's very difficult to inspire action for risk mitigation because it often involves a very significant uh, cost and investment. So I want to say a couple of basic words about the, um, the, the methodology that we've developed. And, and the diagram on the left shows the traditional infinite slope model that has been used for regional scale landslide studies for at least the last decade. This is an excerpt of a paper from my colleague, Scott Miles. And uh, one of the issues with this kind of modeling is that it doesn't capture the wide range of modes that we see in the field. And so this is a photo that I took after the Kaikoura earthquake. And, and what it shows is just in a single scene, three distinct modes of co-seismic landsliding. We see rock slope failures uh, shown in, in yellow is a rotational slump. We also see shallow disrupted failures using the terminology of Dave Kiefer of uh, the USGS. And then off to the left, we see lateral spreading. And so what we aimed to do when we originally developed the multimodal assessment was to capture these uh, specific modes and then implement geotechnical models for each of these across the terrain. And I'll show you an example of how that gets implemented. It's quite popular today to use statistically based landslide hazard models. And I want to say a couple of words about why we've opted not to do that for the kind of work I'm going to be presenting today. We, we have done some work in this area um, around 2010 and 2011 looking at landslides from the Northridge earthquake. And the idea with this is based on observations, what's the combination of geology, morphology, and, and forcing, in this particular case, ground motion resulted in the initiation of landslides. And the idea is that we formulate and train statistical models with landslide inventories. And of course, the key advantage to this approach, and it's really quite powerful, is that there is no need to quantify geotechnical properties over large regions that inherently comes out in the landslide inventory. But there were some issues for us in moving forward and trying to implement this, particularly in a place like Lebanon. Um, one is, is that for Lebanon, we don't have a pre-existing landslide inventory. The model is, uh, is only as strong as the landslide inventory training set. And so it's very much a function of the quality of those inventories that are available. I think at an intellectual level, it's, it's not fully satisfying because it doesn't tell us why. It doesn't allow us to fully disaggregate and really understand the results. And there's questions about the transferability of these kinds of models to other terrains, other regions and geologic settings and so forth. 
Um, I, I think it's also important to recommend to remember that the training inventory represents the predictor conditions at the time of the forcing event. So if you have uh, a rainstorm preceding a, an earthquake, the, um, the outcomes are going to be much different than if it was a dry season, for example. And again, that's inherently reflected in the uh, landslide inventory. And then finally, I want to say that it cannot, at least yet, and I put yet in italics here, effectively capture complex cascading type impacts and risk assessments. And, and I think uh, I've, I've noted yet because I think that's obviously going to change as we continue to collect more and more data after landslide disasters, but I don't think we're there right now. And so we moved forward with a, a physically based and, and empirically based modeling approach. Um, the landslide risk assessment equation is, is relatively straightforward. It's long. It's a little bit easy to describe on a site-specific basis before I talk about a regional scale implementation, but I think many people who have tuned in have, have seen this before. Um, this has been around and, and used since the early 2000s. Um, the upper equation is for risk of loss of life, and this can also be expressed in terms of loss of, of capital assets, but the risk of loss of life is essentially a series of conditional probabilities. Given the probability that a, a landslide occurs, uh, what is the probability that it has the spatial reach to, to reach, for example, in the example below a house? And given that it's reached the house, what's the probability that someone's home? And given that they've been impacted, what is their vulnerability? What's the likelihood that they would be killed by that impact? And then that gets multiplied by the number of people who are exposed. And ultimately, this gets integrated over a whole series of scenario events with different return periods. And again, we can express that same kind of equation just in terms of financial losses instead of loss of life, which is what I've done below. So this is the landslide risk methodology that I'm going to step through this afternoon and involves three distinct steps. The first is regional scale hazard assessment using the multimodal method. And again, there's a, a two-step procedure to this. The first is that we assess the susceptibility to each landslide mode based on topography, in the sense reflecting the terrain. And then second is that we implement mode-specific geotechnical models to assess that hazard. The second part is we estimate runout uh, when that's applicable, and we use an empirically based approach for that. And then the third part is the risk assessment, and that's where we estimate human and or capital losses. And then we repeat that process for other return periods. I want to say that all of the equations and all of the background information on what I'm going to be talking about has, um, has appeared in print. Um, the details of the multimodal method were described in engineering geology. And we've recently published just about a month ago uh, a series of companion papers in Elsevier journals on all of the methodology and background equations for the risk platform. And that is referenced in Pollock et al. Uh, 2019. And I'll provide those references at the end of the presentation. The kind of information or data that's needed to, to feed this risk assessment is, is pretty basic information. For the first step, we need information on terrain, geology. Uh, we use satellite imagery as well, as I'll describe for our case application in Lebanon. We also need the intensity of the forcing, that is the intensity of the, the storm um, or the, the ground motion intensity, if we're considering both of those forcings together. Uh, for the second step for the runout estimation, we need um, data on terrain, and we, we gather that from the first step, the, the digital elevation model. And then finally, for the risk assessment, and really this is very much a function of where we're working and where we're implementing the models, but we typically use a combination of census data, open mapping data, and government databases, and in some cases, data from NGOs. So I'm going to talk a bit about Lebanon, and, and perhaps you might wonder why we've, uh, we've, we've started this work with an application in Lebanon. And, and of course, it's not going to be a surprise to anyone uh, tuning in today that there has been a major humanitarian crisis um, that's occurring in that part of the world. And beginning in 2011 with the um, civil crisis that erupted in Syria, and that's led to a massive influx of refugees into Lebanon, which has raised the population of the country by 40% over just several years. And so, um, and, and I'll say that a majority of the population um, who, are, who are refugees are children. They're people who are um, aged from, from zero to 15. And so, um, again, this is, I think, one of the most significant humanitarian crises of our generation. 
Um, obviously, that population expansion has occurred without the benefit of any kind of formal land use planning, just because of the timeframes that are available. And that's led to a number of pressing questions about Lebanon's refugee placement policies. And so that ultimately motivated that work. We were also trying to answer some, some very basic um, and I think very quite multidisciplinary questions um, along the lines of how do regional crises, humanitarian disasters, and policy making affect a, a country's geologic risk profile. And then finally, from a technical sense, I would say that this was a, a really challenging prospect, uh, um, problem from a couple different aspects. The, the first is we were working in a data limited setting. Lebanon is a middle income nation. It doesn't have the same kind of data resources that we have, for example, in the United States. And secondly, it's a highly active landscape that's affected both by precipitation and seismicity. So just briefly, a little bit about the geology and, and landslides of Lebanon. The, the geology of the, of the country is, is dominated by two mountain ranges, the Lebanon range, which is shown here to the, uh, to the west, and then to the east is the anti-Lebanon range, and that's um, separated by the Becca Valley. The photos on the right show some of the um, photographs we took during our, our two years of field work in the, in the country, and you can see a whole range of, of different styles of landsliding. Um, a number of debris flow hazards, there are rotational slumps, and there's also a number of rock slope failures that we observed um, in, in our travels across the country. The specific data sets that we used for the analyses I'm going to step th uh, through are as follows. We, um, we adopted a, um, a, a national scale geology map and, um, and used that to estimate the geotechnical properties of the underlying materials. Um, we accessed a 15 meter DEM that was provided by the government of Lebanon. And then we used Landstat imagery to estimate root cohesion by way of NVDI. Um, and you'll see the way that that factors in in just a moment. We also use national precipitation maps to estimate storm intensity, and then we utilized a, a probabilistic seismic hazard study that was done for the nation, and that um, helped us estimate ground shaking across the country. And then finally, we used population data from the national census and also from NGOs, and the NGO focus was largely on the refugee crisis and capturing the, uh, the changing populations across the nation over the last five years. So I'm gonna zoom in into to one particular region and, and I'm gonna step through this in some detail. The, the area that I've shown here is just about 25 square kilometers. And so this represents obviously a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall uh, area of Lebanon. The area of Lebanon is in excess of 10,000 square kilometers. So this is a far less than 1% than of our study area, but it allows us to, to take a look at what's really going on under the hood with this landslide risk assessment platform. And, and I'm gonna show you examples for two different um, scenarios. I'm gonna show a 50 year storm event and then about a thousand year seismic event. And then ultimately, I'm going to show risk results that have been integrated across different return periods. And so this is the area of Hamat. And um, if you look at a satellite image, you can see that this is a populated region that also contains um, a number of infrastructure systems, um, including the, the major north-south highway across the country. So the first step in our hazard assessment using the multimodal method is to divide the terrain up into different landslide susceptibilities. And we do that by slope. We take slopes that are in the range of 15 to 50, percent, uh, 50 degrees and, and judge those as being uh, uh, prone or susceptible to shallow planar slides. Slopes that are between 15 and 35 degrees are prone to rotational coherent slumps in soil and rock materials. And then uh, slopes that are in excess or steeper than 35 degrees are um, prone to rockfall. We don't assess uh, any ground that is flatter than 15 degrees, and that's for reasons of computational efficiency that we don't have to be running our models across areas that are unlikely to experience any kind of landsliding. Now, obviously there's some overlap in these, and in cases where, for example, we have a slope that's 25 degrees, we would run separate analyses for both uh, shallow planar slides and for rotational slides. And that with the lowest factor of safety is ultimately what gets, um, what gets mapped. And so this is the depiction of those different landslide terrains. The, the green shows the location of shallow soil slides and, and slumps. The, um, the uh, orange, or I guess that's a 
yellow shows the location of, of uh, rockfall, I'm sorry, of, of, um, of disrupted failures, which are basically sh very shallow failures. And then rockfall is shown in brown. And so I'm gonna step through those individual modes first for our scenario uh, storm events. And um, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on the equations. I would get bogged down with those and those have been described completely in the journal papers I made reference to earlier. So I'm gonna just refer to those for right now and just give you a little bit of an overview, but to say that we assess slumps across the region using a 3D spherical surface whose radius of failure is a function of local relief. And that's measured within a moving window. And obviously the issue here is we're trying to take a routine slope stability analysis and upscale this in a, for a 3D world in GIS. For hazard assessment of debris flow source areas, we've adopted the shell stab model, which couples hydrologic and limit equilibrium slope stability models to compute critical daily rainfall needed to trigger shallow soil failure. And we add a modest amount of root cohesion, and that comes by way of NVDI. And so what I've shown here in blue are the locations of debris flow source areas from our analysis. And then of course, uh, there's a second phase here, which is if we have the potential for a debris flow, we therefore have the potential for runout. And we don't have runout for coherent slumps. They usually don't run out. They, they will obviously damage um, infrastructure and, and, um, and, and property that are on those, but they don't typically become long runout events. And so we don't do a runout analysis for those. Um, but that is the second stage that we use for debris flows. And so we've implemented a, um, a routine that's based on flow lines from a digital elevation model. And we limit the path to 750 meters. And that's been based on a statistical analysis of debris flows in the region of Lebanon. We also assessed um, rock slope failure or, or rockfall hazards. Um, and we can incorporate the, um, the destabilizing effect of, of water in a discontinuity. We model this with a Coleman wedge-like function. And those susceptible locations are shown just at the top of the diagram here in, um, in green. And so you can see this doesn't, uh, this doesn't cover a lot of the area, but there are slope, uh, rock slope hazards that exist. And those are associated with a runout hazard as well. So we use a view shed analysis that basically allows us to, to let these run out in an apron-like fashion below the source area. So this covers the hazards that are related to precipitation event. We have also done this for co-seismic landslide hazards. And the routine's a little bit different or the models are a little bit different. The first four disrupted or shallow depth slides is that we do an infinite slope analysis and then we estimate co-seismic displacements using a regression um, that's based on a, a Newmark sliding block model. And there are a number of these that are available. We've adopted both the one from Randy Gibson as well as Ellen Rathje that have been published over the last decade or so. And that gives us estimates of co-seismic displacement. We then take those estimates and we have established a threshold of five centimeters to identify source areas. And so the idea is if you have less than five centimeters of displacement, we don't see those as being significant enough to really unleash a full co-seismic disrupted landslide. So these are the, are the source areas that are, um, have displacements in excess of five centimeters. And we take that same kind of thinking and we extend it to um, rock slope failures. And so we estimate co-seismic displacements. We set another five centimeter threshold to identify those source areas. And of course, these events are associated with runout. And so now this is the uh, source area along with the runout for the co-seismic hazard. So if I put all of those modes together for the two different scenario events I've mentioned, these are the hazards. So you can see the source areas and then where applicable the, the runout paths that are associated with those. So that's the first and second step together. And if you take a look with, with you know, the, how these results translate to, to what you observe in the field, this is a photo of the area that's encircled in purple. And this shows the rock fall zone that's at the crest of the slope. This is the zone that's susceptible to both debris flows and disrupted slides, depending on whether it's a precipitation trigger or a co-seismic trigger. And then this is the zone that's susceptible to slumps or rotational kinds of failures. And you can see this kind of makes sense with the observed behavior of these slopes of what we see in, 
third step is the risk assessment. And for this, we use an inventory of, uh, of populations that are at risk. And there's two kinds of populations that we disaggregated in this study. We looked at um, urbanized areas or built or developed areas that pre-existed before the Syrian crisis. And then we've also looked at locations of informal refugee settlements, which are basically settlements that have not been urbanized. And so there's two of those. There's one that's very small over here and the other one is depicted in red. But all of the areas that are shown in, in dark gray are urbanized regions. And we also have a database of infrastructure assets through, uh, throughout, this, um, throughout the nation. So if we combine that with the, um, with, the, with the hazard map, you can see that there's some overlap with the hazard in the, um, in the upper part of the region. And then you can see along this other coastal area, there's also overlap between the hazard zones and the population. And of course that occurs through some of the other areas as well, but these are some of the real hot spots. And so ultimately when we apply the risk assessment, we estimate physical vulnerability of the urban population based on data from nations having building types that are very similar to those to the styles that exist in Lebanon. And again, there's a bit more in background of the kind of fragilities and models that we've adopted in the publications. But when we put those together, what this shows is a mapping of annualized loss of life. And this is for the scenario of having different uh, precipitation induced landslides. And so you can see that this area, for example, is free of risk, um, or at least the uh, risk is it's getting mapped up here at the color scale that we've adopted. When that situation changes a bit, when we look at co-seismic landslides, you can see that there's a co-seismic landslide risk that exists here that doesn't for precipitation and lands uh, induced landslides. And alternatively, these modes go away. So ultimately we put these together and these are the results compiled across the entire nation. So now we've zoomed out to the 10,000 square kilometer scale. And one of the things that's really a nice about this kind of approach is it allows us to disaggregate risk according to different regions or according to the entire nation. So I'm just gonna offer a couple um, insights that we've gathered just by taking this risk data apart. And the first is, is that we see that the brief flows and associate runout are responsible for about 93% of the overall landslide risk in the nation of Lebanon. Majority of those losses are from frequent and widespread low intensity events. And that's in contrast to the more significant but less frequent intense storms, for example. And other types of landslides have a less significant impact. And that's largely because they don't have the same kind of run out footprint as debris flows. And so this is the data again, compiled across the entire country. We could do this as a heat map as well. It gets depicted at this scale a little bit easier with, um, with a uh, mapping of annualized loss of life proportional to the um, blue symbol. And these different color symbols refer to the different modes of landsliding. If you um, take this data, you can, in order to, to get a sense of what the societal risk is in Lebanon, to, to get an idea of, of where this stands to other nations, if, if we plot those in an FN characteristic diagram, which shows the annualized frequency of different numbers of fatalities, um, you can see that this data pretty much plots um, in, a, in that's on par at least with other landslide prone nations. And so it's not extraordinary, but it is uh, quite high and somewhat in excess of what is often deemed to be acceptable by some international standards. I'm not gonna have time to talk about this today, but we've stepped through the same exercise for estimating uh, capital losses to buildings and to infrastructure systems. And that's been reported in a separate article by Pollock et al. 2019C. And, um, and basically it's the same kind of approach, but now we're looking at the value of these assets. I'm going to go back to the loss of life data and then try to disaggregate this by time because I think we see a lot of interesting trends related to the refugee crisis, but I think this also highlights the way that risk varies in time according to population and to land use. And so if we look at these diagrams that are shown in the left side of the, uh, of the article, uh, this shows debris flow, risk, uh, precipitation-induced rockfall, and so forth, all of the different modes in terms of annualized loss of life 
across the five-year time frame. And, and so the first thing you can see is that in, in blue is the, is the data for the Lebanese population that uh, was there before the Syrian refugee crisis. And of course, they hold a majority of the societal risk merely because of the population is greater than the Syrian refugees. Um, the risk to encamped or informal um, encampments for Syrian refugees is highly variable through time, and that's shown in the green, green diagram here. And that's because of their largely transient nature. And it's also quite high because of the, of the increased vulnerability of often having temporary shelters that oft offer less protection against debris flows and rockfall compared to, for example, um, uh, the more routine built structures. And then finally, there's an interesting drop in the risk here in 2016 that reflects movement from um, rebel, uh, rebel allied Syrians during a, a, a period of a particularly intense conflict in the Arsal area. And basically a movement of, of refugees outside of that area during that time of conflict who then later came back. And you can look at some of the other diagrams and get similar information. There's a heavy refugee influx that into a, um, into a rockfall prone area. And you can see that that's changing with time. And again, that's reflecting the transient nature of those flows. And then if you take a look at the co-seismic disrupted landslides and, and co-seismic landslides in general, you can see uh, that generally the loss of life is quite low for these compared to debris flows and to the rock falls. And so these represent a relatively uh, or a much lower hazard. And as I mentioned earlier, 93% of the hazard is contained up here. So there's a lot of information here. And I'd say that overall, what we found is that there is a disproportionate 75% increase in landslide risk in Lebanon um, since the start of the, Lebanon, of the uh, Syrian crisis. And that has really everything to do with the population increase, but also higher vulnerability and exposure to those who are in um, informal settlements. So uh, the question is, is how valid is this data and, 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 and can this, uh, you, we, how, do, how do we check this data? And we had a natural experiment that occurred in January 2019. We had a intense storm. I, I don't know what the return period has not been documented, but we know that it triggered a number of landslides um, very close to Hamat, an area known as Chechem. Um, it injured three people and closed the highway. And these are some press reports. So this is our, our pre-events mo model, and this is for a 50-year storm event. And so we really can't compare apples with apples here because we don't know what the return period is of this particular storm event. But I think one thing that's encouraging is, is that a lot of the modes that we had forecast in advance of this event, in fact, came to fruition. And you see a lot of these kind of run out landslides onto the highway and so forth. So that gives us some confidence in the ability to forecast that hazard. Now, when we compare the, the risk results, the, the results are not quite as accurate. And I'll say that we did a database search of recorded landslide fatalities in Lebanon between 1975 and 2015 using uh, Arabic and English language nude services that revealed 146 fatalities that were conclusively caused by landslides. And we believe that average is about four a year. We, we know this is an incomplete inventory. We know there's a strong recording bias in time with more recent events being recorded at, at greater resolution and more detail. We also know that a lot of the um, injuries and fatalities to refugees have not yet been reported. So it's likely to be an underestimation, but nevertheless, our projections are for close to 40 fatalities a year, and that significantly exceeds the recorded data by an order of magnitude. So why might that occur? Well, one is obviously related to the underreporting of the landslide fatalities, but there are some other reasons as well. Um, another is that our physically based models tend towards conservatism. Uh, we have a 15 meter resolution that obscure, obscures small uh, check dams and debris flow mitigation measures that otherwise don't get accounted in our runout analysis. We don't account for short term variations in exposure. We assume that people are there full time. And we do not account for the ability of people to avoid impending or ongoing hazards, that is to leave a dangerous region. So what's next? We have a, a second version of the platform that we've been testing for close to the last nine months or so. It has a number of enhancements over the, the version one platform I've just described. It has an optimized 3D failure surface routine. It has an enhanced rock slope failure model. We've integrated uh, the, the triggers model that was developed at the USGS. And this is a much more robust model that allows us to capture transient rainfall infiltration. 
We've integrated a random walk 3D runout trajectory algorithm. Um, we've now included the ability to implement uh, vulnerability fragility functions. The, func the code is now fully probabilistic, so we can run a number of Monte Carlo type probabilistic simulations. And, um, and we're currently engaged in some comprehensive testing against well-documented landslide events in New Zealand, particularly the Kaikoura earthquake that's based on the um, recently developed landslide inventory developed at GNS. And we are applying this to several testbed locations where loss of life and financial losses have also been known. And that is in Seattle, Portland, and in a community in New Zealand. And ultimately this code exists as a, as a robust Python based modular type code. And I say modular because it allows us to plug in advanced models as we continue to develop and it evolves. So I wanna close with a couple thoughts. And, and the first is that I think landslide risk maps provide really significant value over traditional hazard maps. For about another 15 or 20% investment in resources, you get much more actionable information. But I also think it gets away from this issue of having the, 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 the hazard maps covered with red, with hazard zones, and instead allows us to really focus and take some of the noise out and focus on the populations who are at risk. I think the second point is that landslide risk mapping is realistic and achievable. We, we got this to work in an area that has uh, moderate quality data. And, um, and I think implementing this in the US as we've seen with our current studies for Seattle and Portland allows us to have a much richer data set and to have even better predictions. And so I think this is within our grasp. And then finally, I'll say that the, the risk mapping provides important fundamental understanding. In this case, we've applied this to some international policy questions pertaining to reg, uh, refugees and the sheltering of refugees in urbanized areas versus camps and so forth. And it also serves as a scientific reference for landslide policy. So I, uh, I'm gonna wrap up here. I'll make reference to um, a, a number of publications that, uh, that have come out over the last couple of years, again, that detail this. And at this point, I think I will turn this back over to Scott and let him moderate any questions that, that might. Uh, Thank you very much, Joe. Very interesting. Uh, this is Scott Anderson. Uh, I'll take for about the next uh, 18 minutes or maybe 15 minutes or so uh, some questions that have been posted in the chat pod, excuse me, not the chat pod, uh, but the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. If you have other questions, you can post them there and I'll try to get them answered by uh, Joe as well. Um, <clears throat> So, so uh, I've got several questions here, and, and I think maybe uh, starting uh, with the multimodal uh, nature, uh, questions are, uh, for example, what input goes into uh, the inferred slope hazards, like uh, slumps and debris flows besides uh, slope angles? Um, could, could you talk a little bit more about that, Joe? Yeah, I'll say that at the outset of this work, we, we looked at um, a combination of both uh, basic slope parameters as well as other kind of morphological parameters, like, for example, convexity or concavity. And what we found is really the best correlation existed with just slope. When you started to add in some of the other slope morphology measures, it added quite a bit of noise. And so um, it, is a, um, it is a relatively simple screening procedure, but I'll say that it's also based on a lot of statistical work that have looked at, at the correlations between landslide mode of failure and the, um, and the slope that was in place before that landslide occurred. And so it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a very basic model um, and, and we didn't see much in the way of additional value when we did our statistical analysis early on by adding in those, those other kinds of parameters. In fact, we just felt that it was adding more variability and uncertainty to the process. Excellent. All right. There are a couple of questions on the 15 degrees uh, threshold that you mentioned in the work in Lebanon. And um, one of them had to do with, uh, you know, how would you catch lateral spreading? And, and another had to do with that there are some certain geologic terrains where, uh, you know, many slopes are unstable at, at, uh, at less than 15 degrees. Um, can, can you talk about that a little bit and then maybe about the, um, yeah, you know, wrapping into that, just some some thoughts on scale. Like that was a, a based, a, as I understand it, uh, on some uh, 
if, if you will, uh, landslide inventories and, and statistical observations from the area of interest, from Lebanon. And so how would you calibrate that elsewhere? Yeah, well, let me begin with the, the, the point about the 15 degree threshold. And, um, and I'll say that in the original work on the, the multimodal method that we published in engineering geology, it includes a, a fourth module for uh, liquefaction induced lateral spreading. In fact, that multimodal model was originally developed just for co-seismic landslides. There wasn't a provision for precipitation induced events. Um, we, we didn't include it in the work that I presented today because um, we've been kind of waiting for some improved liquefaction and lateral spreading modules to be developed. There's a couple projects that are currently in progress and we would like to ultimately integrate those into the model. But, um, but so when I say less than 15%, we're not in this point including lateral spreads, although that was again in, in some of the original model formulation. And I think that that will come out in a, in a future version of this platform. Um, you had a question also, or a, a very good point about uh, what about terrain, not necessarily lateral spreading, but terrain that's flatter than 15 degrees that also has a susceptibility to landslides. And I'll say that that threshold really needs to be thought about in a um, kind of a region by region basis. We don't see that kind of terrain in Lebanon, which largely consists of, of sedimentary rocks and, and a lot of limestones and, and siltstones and sandstones and so forth. And those kinds of materials have not produced those, those flat landslides, relatively flat landslides that you're making reference to. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a universal um, uh, threshold. There's no reason why we can't lower it. And in fact, we, we originally started to work with a much higher threshold. And um, when we were submitting the, the engineering geology paper, we received a very thoughtful review that, that, that questioned that threshold. And, and we lowered it. The only cost to us is simply in terms of computational time. And so we can easily extend that. Um, we're trying to watch our time because uh, not necessarily the time for the webinar, but we're trying to watch our computational time because now as we move more towards the mode of doing Monte Carlo simulations, we're looking at the, at the idea of something very similar to what's done for hurricanes, where you look at different, you know, tens of thousands of simulations with different paths. We're looking at different kinds of particular storm events that have different characteristic geospatial signatures and, and kind of better discretization of seismic events and so forth. So we're trying to keep our eye on that, but, um, but that can be lowered. And, and, and that 15%, I think, again, was, was, was very applicable for Lebanon, not necessarily other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple other questions uh, related to scale, and one of them is computational time related. Do you, is there any measure you can share with us about the you know, time for computation in the region you showed in Lebanon? In Lebanon? So the, the scale is... Um, is um, proportional, as you might imagine, to the pixel size of the analysis. And so that analysis for Lebanon was done on a, on a 15 meter pixel size basis. And so that ran relatively fast. We've been running this on a, on a desktop Macintosh and we've been able to do those simulations over the order, a single simulation in about an hour and a half, an hour and, and 15 minutes or so. Now that changes significantly for our study areas in New Zealand and in Seattle and in Portland, because there we have one meter DEMs. And, and really a vision of this work is to anticipate the adoption of the three debt program and, and, and looking forward to a day where we have this high resolution data that can improve, for example, our debris flow models and particularly the infiltration aspects of those. So that significantly slows things down and, um, and those, uh, those runs right now, and, and I'm going to say that this is about a, a probably a three-year-old desktop computer, but those simulations at that finer resolution over the scale of metropolitan Seattle are taking something in the order of about six to seven hours per run. And so our plan is ultimately move these to a Monte Carlo simulation on a much faster computer, but that's where we stand right now. So it's, it's not really untenable, but, um, but this is, um, it, it is, is not something that we run through in just a couple of minutes. I see. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on, the, on downscaling of, of the results? I mean, you're, you're showing uh, fairly specific areas. In fact, you saw, saw that as one of, your, um, one of the uh, advantages that, that large uh, regions of susceptibility were boiled down to smaller ones of risk. Um, 
it, it, sort of, if you could talk to that a little bit and, and maybe what you see is the intended use of the products as you, you vision the future. Yeah, and I'm going to answer that question with, with reference to this slide. I'm going to back up a bit because we looked very carefully at this. And, and I want to say that, um, that we have some, uh, some descriptions of, of our intended use of this kind of data and, 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 and the, the role of scale and pixel size and so forth and how accurate these predictions are. I, I don't, um, and, and I actually should back up and, and really I prefer not even to use the word prediction, but rather I, I tend to use the word forecast. And I like to talk about verification because I really don't think we can fully validate these because we don't have the full range of conditions and storm events and so forth. Um, nevertheless, the, the intention is, is not to, uh, to, to be able to discretize these results to the meter scale or perhaps even to the, the 10 or 20 or 30 meter scale. Um, but instead identify risk hotspots that might be, um, uh, might be worthy of doing a more intense site specific analysis. Um, having said that, uh, you, we have a test right here. And again, I, I said that this is for the 50 year storm event and I don't know what the intensity is of the event that occurred recently in Lebanon. Um, but, but what you can see is that we are capturing the source areas and, uh, and some of the run out paths pretty close. And then there's some other areas that are probably within about 20 or 30 meters or so um, that also initiated that we didn't capture with our forecasting here. So. I, I don't certainly do not want to oversell the ability of this to to hyper localize the the hazard and and the risk, but I, I think really the best application, particularly when we're, we're we're applying this over the scale of of a of a nation like Lebanon, in excess of, of ten thousand square kilometers, is to identify those hot spots rather than specific pixels of failure and hot spots that might require some additional attention or might be worth moving populations from or implementing mitigation measures. Okay. I have a couple questions related to the root cohesion and the root strength and the use of the NDVI. Could, could you talk to that a little bit? Yes, and I'm gonna uh, back up a bit and I'll say that the only time we use that is for the debris flow module. And I'm gonna uh, step back to that um, you don't mind me flipping through these slides uh, too quickly. Um, I'll say that the, the root cohesion that we add is, is really quite modest and it's on the order of three to seven KPA and it varies as a function of what the NVDI uh, value is with the idea that that is depicting different types of vegetation of being at shrubbery or trees or, or low lying grasses or, or areas that are largely devoid of vegetation. The, the reason it's important to add that in is just a tiny bit of root cohesion plays a really um, important role in, um, in, in kind of taming down these models. If they have no cohesion, um, and, and we know that you know, there, there's, there's various sources of, of apparent cohesion that close, that's, that's close to the ground surface. It's not just root cohesion, but it's from partial saturation as well. So unless we include just a bit, we tend to have the entire area turn red. We add just a little bit, and again, we, we wanted to have some basis for doing it. We didn't want to randomly um, kind of artificially add that in across the region, but, um, and, and we did this, and I'm gonna say the details of this have, have been described in the engineering geology paper that we published in 2016, the actual values and the calibration experiments we did using data from the Northridge earthquake. Um, which has a Mediterranean climate that's quite similar to that in Lebanon. And so the, the full details are there, but basically what I'll say is we're adding very little and, and, and really the purpose is to, um, to, to try to realistically capture just this tiny bit of, re of resistance that exists at the ground surface, because otherwise we make these um, very conservative forecasts of debris flows. Okay. Hey, <clears throat> one thing I want to add here, and it's not because Joe just said something that made me think of it. It's because I just remembered to say it, that it is important to note that the, um, uh, th this work and the conclusions that Joe has, has drawn here uh, are his, and, and they do not represent the uh, National Academy or, or uh, uh, the, the Committee on uh, Geological and Geotechnical Engineering that's hosting this webinar. I meant to say that earlier, Joe, uh, and, and just getting to it now.
Okay, uh, thank you, Scott. And of course, that extends to the United States Agency for International Development and NSF as well, um, particularly with some of our um, findings related to um, policy uh, related to refugee settlements. Yeah, I've got a couple uh, other sort of themes of questions here, and, and and one is about the fragility of, of, of the buildings and vulnerability of people in, of the occupants and so on, the sort of the risk side of, of the equation here. And, and another one is um, about the computation, but let's, let's go to the, um, the, the, the fragility and, and vulnerability uh, uh, ideas, Joe. Okay, so what I say is that right now we're using step functions for the for the vulnerabilities, and so it's really quite coarse. That's one of the, the significant changes that we've implemented in version two of this platform is the ability to truly put in a fragility function, a probabilistic function, and so we can sample from that function. Uh, basically, that will show the vulnerability as an intensity of the uh, of the landslide and that intensity is linked to the height of the landslide. So I'm going to say that's that's the way it's changed but just backing up and focusing on this work for a moment um, because it is a very important factor. The the temporary settlements that exist in Lebanon are, are essentially tents and, and offer really no resistance to debris flows and so our assumption there is that if you are impacted by a debris flow and you're in a tent the loss of life is one. So it's uh, there's no step function there. It's if you're hit, uh, we are assuming that that would result in a fatality. If you're in a structure, we've adopted um, vulnerability values from the published literature. There's been a, a whole series of these that have been published. A lot of them have come out of, of British Columbia as, as well as a, a number of other places in Europe. And so we've adopted those based on the building types that we see in, in Lebanon. And, um, and uh, those values are certainly less than one offhand. I don't remember, they, those are described in the, in the recent 2019, the specifics of what values we use, but I believe there's something on the order of, of about one half. Okay. Just a couple minutes left, and maybe the, uh, another uh, sort of theme of questioning here is about um, you know, com communicating this information. Um, and, and to uh, decision makers, and, and you mentioned the uh, House bill, the, um, HR 1261 at the beginning of this. Um, have you thoughts, have, have you, do you have some thoughts uh, on uh, how this type of information can be communicated other, to other audiences besides like who you have on the call here today? Yeah, I, I'm part of a project at the University of Washington called M9, and there's been a, a kind of big theme through our, our project. It's an NSF hazard seas project that is looking at the potential outcomes of a Cascadia earthquake in terms of tsunamis, um, long period uh, structures susceptible to Cascadia kind of ground motions as well as landslides. And so this has been a big theme is how do we take this kind of technical information, a lot of it very geospatial and communicate that to, to members of the public and to decision makers and so forth. I would, I, I've really learned a lot about this from working very closely with GNS Science. I feel that they have had some of the, the best uh, risk communication products. And, and if you Google up um, a landslide risk uh, maps for GNS Science or for the Christchurch area, you can, you can find some examples of those. Um, they have really taken it to, to, to a, a level of, of, of a combination of techniques that involve things like um, the, uh, publishing maps and making those available in digital form, but also integrating those with stories of people who are within different hazard zones. And so they have the story of a family whose house is now in a, realized in a very risky area and the story of a family who, who lives a kilometer away, who is, who's in not in that kind of area, but might want to take uh, some risk mitigation measures. I think it's a super important question. I don't have a, a, a great um, a single answer for it, except that I try to, um, to, to emulate, and I think uh, what GNS has done, and I think they've really been at the forefront of this, and I think they've also really been fantastic in integrating social scientists with their technical teams to, to help uh, the, the technical uh, experts get those results to members of the public. Excellent. Hey, Joe, I just want to, we're running out of time here, and I want to thank you for a very interesting presentation, including the answers here at the end, and I want to thank the participants that 
Uh, we're here with us this afternoon, and many of you who asked questions that I was not able to get to, but I did my best to compile some, and hopefully um, uh, we can, it, it's quite valuable what you, you've all offered. So thank you, and you'll see on the slide right now is, is an announcement that I want to close with, and, and that is that our committee is having a, a meeting on June 27, the, the subject of managing mine waste risks. Uh, practice limitations and needed research. Uh, that is something uh, that there is some availability to join in person and or remotely. Um, and Sam Magsino, whose email address is on the screen, is the right person to talk to if you have an interest in, in uh, supporting the committee's activities that way too. Um, with, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Marty or Sam if there's anything uh, else that needs to be said. Uh, again, I thank you all very much. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. This is Marty. And um, Joe, I want to thank you on behalf of the committee and the academies for your presentation. It was extremely interesting and valuable. Uh, and thank you all for participating. Well, thank, thank you for the time. invitation. I really appreciate uh, this. And, and thanks to the committee for coordinating and organizing this. Our pleasure. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all. Goodbye.